So, I mean, there's many things, really. Uh, I suppose on the musical side, there's just certain incidents. Um, I remember one time uh, we were packing up the, light, the gear from a light show. We were doing a light show at the Speakeasy, and uh, and it was about three three o'clock in the morning. In, in walked uh, Hendrix with BB King and uh, Georgie Fame, and they all uh, started jamming together. And we were the only audience, Doug and myself, and, just, and Dave Bowen, like wrapping up all the wiring and everything. We just stopped and you know just a performance just for us, you know. And there's another time I remember. Another moment where he's staying at Paul's and he, he uh, John Lennon was over and they were putting some of the tracks together for Sergeant Pepper and uh, Paul said, uh, "Do you mind if we if we retire to the music room just to knock this song together?" And I said, "No, that's fine." So I occupied myself reading a book or something. And eventually they came back down, downstairs and said, uh, uh, "We've just put this tune together. I'd like you to listen to it," which was. Um, uh, it's getting better, so I was the first person ever to hear that, you know, which uh, it's a nice feeling, you know. Uh, there were all kinds of uh, incidents, I mean, uh, uh, I remember one time when we were painting the uh, one of the shops, in, the shop fronts in the King's Road, and uh, this is when it was by Nervous and Bourne, and uh, Doug and I were painting, it must have been about, uh, we'd, pa we'd often paint on the, on the boards themselves inside the shop in the middle of the, in the, middle of the night. And uh, it'd get quite contemplative just painting away there, just quietly, no, no sound of traffic, nothing. Uh, but then Dave, uh, he, he could never stand not having anything to do. So he, and he, we'd think we'd have to find something for him to do because otherwise he'd pick up a paintbrush and chances are we'd have to paint over what he'd done, you know, because he'd invariably make a mess of it. And he said, suddenly he said, uh, do you fancy a tea from the tea stall down the road, you know, and something to eat? And we said, yeah, that'd be good, Dave. And some, anything to occupy him, so off he shot in the, in the painted Buick. And uh, he went down to uh, Sloan Square, where there was a, there was a tea stall. And uh, typical Dave, he got into an argument with this other guy who was in the queue. And uh, next thing, Dave's pushed his hot dogs that were meant for us into this guy's face. And the guys run to his car, and Dave noticed that he, there was about four other guys in the car. So Dave jumps in the Buick and races all the way back. Instead of just losing him, he drives all the way back to, to the uh, inside the store where we're working. And the uh, uh, first thing we knew of it, it just comes bursting through the door. You know, turn out the lights, grab a hammer, you know, and Doug and I kind of like pacifists, you know, and we're shaking, you know, I think what's going on, you know. And uh, the next thing, this, we saw this car screech up outside the door and these guys rushing to come into the shop. And I could see this guy with all these bits of food sticking to his face, which I thought was a funny, strange sight. The next thing, Dave's got this big billy can of hot tea and he throws it all over this guy who's got the hot dog on his face. So the guy finished up with our tea as well. And he screamed and shot off and next thing they drove around the block and came back around the front and then threw stones at the shop front. Luckily none of them broke the glass. But by this time Doug and I was, were, in, were incensed because we'd, we'd had all this aggression coming at us not knowing the justification for it. So we all shot out into the Buick and chased these guys down the King's Road. And as we were going through the traffic lights they were on green, but as we went through them, the car came through, must have been on red from the other side, and smashed into the side of the Buick. All the paintwork, everything, you know. And uh, we got, by this time, we were really livid. And we stormed out of the car, and it was just this sweet little old American guy, a bit like Mr. Magoo from the old cartoons, and he came up, and he was so full of apologies and so upset, more upset than we were. So we kind of had to kind of tread back, you know, and sort of, calm down very quickly and say, it's all right, we're going to finish up trying to placate him. It's only a car, it's only a car, you know. But that was a typical day in the life of Dave Bourne, who was <laughs> our manager, you know. So, uh, so living with him was a bit of a nightmare, you know. And uh, during the interim, I mean, when I finished, when Mike and I finished, uh, and I came up north with Madeline, and uh, I, we had a commission from uh, Abs Ab Ab Sheikh Abdulaziz Zaidan to do uh, a mural for the uh, ceramic mural for or 16 ceramic murals 
for the uh, Saudi Arabian Ministry of Defence building in Riyadh. And at that time we just lived in a little country cottage on the North York Moors. And uh, but we had them brought, brought, brought up lorry loads of these tiles and we did it in sections on the, on the cottage floor and numbering every tile on the back. So we never got to see it in its entirety, you know, except I got photographs of it. And, uh, but the Sheikh was so pleased with it that he then commissioned me to do a, a, a mural, to illustrate the Rubai of Omar Khayyam uh, as a ceramic mural for his palace in Al-Khaj, which was 60 metres by, I think 60 metres by 30. It's huge. And we did that one in an aircraft hangar in Stoke, because yeah. I've been there and wanted to see it all laid out. Using proper gold as well, and it's just gallons of gold, you know, like, this is incredible. Well, the, the, the initially the Beatles one was uh, we would paint we painted the cobra for Tara Brown, and Tara was a close friend of Paul's, and uh, he felt that you know Paul would like to meet us, so that's that's how that one came about. Um, others were just I mean like Townsend through Mike. Mike was already Mike McKinnon was already a friend of Pete's, and then uh, I think through Pete I got to know the the faces really well, and. Uh, Ronnie Lane lived with me when the faces, when the small faces broke up. There was that interim period before they became the faces, and uh, Ronnie came to live with me at that time because he was he was home. But him and his wife came and lived at my place in Richmond. Uh, so I saw that whole kind of period of when they uh, metamorphosis from the face, the small faces to the faces, and it was interesting to see. Uh, I mean, Ron Wood was brought into the setup, and but they didn't want another lead singer because they they'd had a big bust up with Steve Marriott because they felt it, it was too much of an ego and it was becoming he was wanting to become Steve Marriott and the fa and the small faces which they didn't want uh, so they were very much against having Rod Rod Stewart into the band in the first place mm -hmm. but Ron Wood being an old school friend of Rod's he wanted him in there so he was pushing for it all the time. Um, uh, but R Rod Stewart kept saying at the time that it'll never be Rod Stewart in the faces, it'll just always be the faces, I'll just be one of the band, you know. Like, within 12 months it was Rod Stewart in the faces, and that's when everything, you know, yeah. split up from there. But uh, it was it was good times and seeing them all, um, you know, Ronnie li writing a lot of the t tracks in my place and, uh, you know, going going through them with him, you know. Like,